Um, we are um, lucky to have four individuals here joining us today as a panel to talk about their perspectives, their advice, their experience with the callback interview process at their firms. So um, we have uh, bios on each of them, and I, we have extensive bios on each of them. This is Buzzes. And I won't go through each one of them, but I wanted you to be able to see this and let me know if you'd like a copy of this information. Um, Buzz Fron is here. He's a, um, a litigation partner at Simpson Thatcher, specializing in intellectual property and antitrust. And you see all, all the firm and personal accomplishments here. He is a graduate of Vanderbilt Law School. Next to him, we have Neve Cox, who is a recruiting, professional recruiting and development coordinator at Finnegan Henderson. And that's a law firm that many of you know specializes in intellectual property. And Neve has participated in many events at this law school, <laughs> the high tech. Um, career fair and many other events. She's been on the other side of the table. Um, all of these individuals, the first three individuals, have all been on the other side of the, the table interviewing-wise. So they have a lot of experience working with um, doing interviews for some associates and laterals, etc. cetera. Um, we also have Michelle Bazou, who is an intellectual property associate at Gunderson Detmer in Redwood City. Um, she also has experience both intellectual property and also patent experience. Um, and she is a graduate from uh, graduate from University of Michigan Law School in 2009. And then finally, we have our very own Nicholas Ham, who's a third-year law student. Just finished his summer at Morrison Forrester and successfully got an offer for a full-time position as a um, intellectual uh, litigation associate, right? litigation associate at Morrison Forrester in the Palo Alto office to start after the bar exam in 2013. And he's going to share some of his experiences from the perspective of your shoes, the student who's interviewing on that side of the interview table. So um, let me just close this down, and I'll sit down. I've got some questions. Maybe what we should do is start me with you. I'm going to go around here and sit down. But um, since you're sort of behind the scenes and coordinating the callback interviews, and you see the, how, how the, the interviewers and interviewees get matched, maybe you can start by saying a little bit about what you think makes a successful callback interview day and how you see it go. Um, my perspective is the most important thing you can do is be yourself. Um, if you've made it to the point of getting a call that interview, that means you already look good on paper in terms of hiring needs, hiring criteria, and things like that. Um, and the people that you met with um, on campus saw something. They, they liked you. So you're already, you've already passed that hurdle. Um, and one of the most important things that we try to get out of we're trying to get to know you. Um, you know, fit is a very, very important part of what we're looking for. Um, and it goes both ways, you know. It's a great opportunity for you to find out if you know, the people that you're going to be working with eventually, if you mesh with them, if you enjoy working with them. So it really is a two-way street. Um, in terms of who you are interviewing with, we work really hard to try to pair you up with people who you would potentially be working with. So, for example, if you're interested in intellectual property and you have an electrical background, I'm going to try to schedule you to meet with individuals who do that kind of work, who have that kind of background. Um, you know, it's really, people get very nervous about these things, but it's really a casual conversation. People are trying to get to know you. Are you going to work hard? Are you going to be a team player? Um, and they want to know about you. Um, so, I mean, I think the best callback interviews are when people relax and just be themselves and, you know, let the people that you're meeting with know who you are. Um, that's what I mean. Great. Any other comments to add there? I think that, I mean, that is exactly right. When I, when I wrote down my notes uh, in terms of you know, what I wanted to convey to y'all, it's, you know, just relax and let your personality shine through um, because uh, it's not only important for the firm to you know, get a, a sense of who you are and, and what the fit might be like, but it's also important to make sure that you feel like the, the fit's good. Um, and just like maybe said, when, once you're in the callback process, you've already, uh, you know, the firm's already ticked the boxes on the objective question, you know, is this person qualified, you know, can they do the work, you know, do they have, you know, based on their law school record and the on-campus interview, you know, do they have the ability to actually function as, as, a, as you know, a person uh, in our firm? And so that stuff is, is done, and, and really it's, it's, it's about, it's about the, the, the softer side of, uh, of the interview process once you're once you're back in the in, in the callback section. I would say, you know, there's some important stuff to make sure that you're comfortable and relaxed in the interview, and that's do your homework ahead of time, right? I mean, make sure that you've researched about the firm. You know, like if you um, you know 
know, you're interested in work and perhaps they don't have a corporate practice and you ask that question and it's going to look really, it's going to feel really awkward. <laughs> Has that um, happened to you a lot? Um, well, we have a corporate practice. Well, here's what's happened to me, right? So we do IP litigation, it's what I, what I do a lot of, but we have, you know, a broader <clears throat> general corporate practice. Um, and one thing we don't do, however, is patent prosecution. So I've had people come in and start talking to me about their desire to do patent prosecution. And it, it is, it's a little, I, I, I try to cut it off quickly and painlessly, but it's, um, it, it is a little, it is a little awkward, but it's the kind of thing that it, you, you, you did spend more time doing a little bit of homework and, and taking, you know, does this, you know, do, what do they do and where are my interests align there? That, that'll um, pay off a lot. And it also makes you more confident because you've done your homework and, you know, you, you're prepared, and that's you know 99 percent of being a lawyer is being prepared, and you know that allows you to be comfortable and, and really let your relaxed self shine through. If I could actually add one more thing, that's a really good point. Um, just going a little further in terms of doing homework, um, as far as I know, almost every firm is going to send you your schedule before you go in for the callback, so you're going to know who you're going to be meeting with in advance, and it's great if you want to go online and look at the bios of some of the people. And if someone has a practice area that you're really interested in, you know, if you can think about some questions for them um, that are really related to the practice, that's a really good thing to do. And it really demonstrates that you're interested in the kind of work. That or even their personal history. Exactly. Because they went to their undergrad and exactly. took their bio and some information about the person. Definitely. Michelle, I'll ask you this question. Um, what common mistakes have you seen in interviews? As, <coughs> with you as an interviewer, what have you seen have gone wrong? <coughs> Um, going back to what um, Buzz was saying earlier, definitely unprepared. So there is this fine line between being yourself and being relaxed. I, you know, I don't want to talk with someone who's very stiff, but at the same time, sitting across the table and showing me that they have no idea what office they've just come in. Um, and like Buzz was saying, telling me that it, it, my former law firm, I used to do patent litigation, and it was plainly obvious from our website and even a very cursory um, research that we didn't really do that much copyright or trademark. And I've had candidates say, oh, I'm really interested in copyright and trademark and being a little too relaxed and telling me how patents are so boring. Um, so two, two, why, why is that a wrong answer? Two major things going on here. One, you really have no idea who I am. I mean, you have no idea what office you're sitting in and who we are. Um, and number two, you've just insulted my practice area, and you've just told me that what I do is awfully boring. I find it super interesting, and that's why I pick it. So, so these are the couple of things that will go wrong. The second piece, and again, I've seen it with multiple candidates, um, don't lecture your interviewer. I've had people, again, tell me, even when I was a second year or third year, I know about the practice of law, and blah, 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 because, you know, my cousin or my brother-in-law or somebody is a partner at a law firm and I know about that and I can do it. Um, it again, this was the tone and just, you know, we do want you to be confident and tell us that, you know, you're excited about doing the hard work and everything else, but it's just a little bit, um, it's a little bit off to tell, you know, even an associate or, you know, much less a partner, I know what you're doing every day and I think I can do it with my eyes closed. Um, big mistake. Just really don't do that. And and the bad part about that is that you're so far along in this process. Like we said, you do have the grades, you do have the, the right resume, you have the right credentials, right? And you come in and you say, you know, candidates would say these wild things that, you know, it's just going to go south from there. Um, these are the major things that I've done. And again, this has happened more than you would think. So, <laughs> um, so you know. Keep that in mind. Um, and one word about preparation. Um, use you know whatever resources the school gives you. Try to look up people um, that have summered in the practice area, in the office that you're going back to do the callback. Um, try to get, if you know other lawyers and you know so on and so forth, um, try to get some first-hand accounts. I do know that a lot of times it's difficult to tell these firms apart just based on their website. Um, so, so try as much as you can to talk with someone who spent some time um, at that particular law firm in that particular practice. Again, keep in mind, especially with large law firms, they do vary. The offices do vary from city to city. So be really careful. You know, if you go to a law firm in San Francisco and you say, oh, I would love to do white-collar crime, that's what I've been 
dreaming of forever, and it turns out that that office does zero white collar crime, and in fact that's the DC office, and uh, you can't really get on those cases, you know, there are all these complications. Again, that kind of shows that you're not really clear what it is you, you want or, you know, why you're in that office. Thank you. So, Nicholas, you just went through this a year ago. What is the structure of a callback interview day like? What was that like for you? What did you, you went to? Um, so, typically, it's, you know, you're there for about four or five hours, and you're just doing a series of these 20-minute, 20, 20 to 30-minute interviews with various attorneys at the firm. Um, usually, like you said, you'll meet with people who you'll possibly be working with in the future. Um, and it, it's pretty similar, in my experience, to the screening interviews that are done on OCI. It's just you know, one right after the other. So it's kind of a, a marathon thing that you have to be on, uh, not only you know, for those 20 minutes, but the four hours uh, that you're there at the firm. Um, so yeah, to, I think some firms do you know, a lunch or, or a breakfast. I didn't have too many of those. I, I kind of avoided uh, wanting to, to do that, because then I'd be on for just that much longer. <laughs> um, so. Uh, for, for me, it was you know six or seven you know, twenty minute interviews uh, right in a row. Okay. okay, so here's here's a question. This might be more appropriate for me or, or those of you that are, are already in the law firms. Um, what if students are not sure exactly what practice area they want to focus on, or what if they're even if they're not sure about corporate versus litigation? How do you advise the students handle that when they're interviewing? Well, just be be honest about it, right? I mean, don't. It doesn't do you any service to tell us what you think we want to hear, right? Tell us what you actually want. And if, you, if you're not sure, that's fine. I mean, we encourage, you know, different firms have different models. Um, our model is that if you come in as a summer associate and you're open to doing, you know, corporate and litigation and you want to explore both, you'll get the opportunity to do both. You don't have to make a hard pick at the beginning of the summer and then you're you know, in that for, for better or for worse for the rest of the summer and your career. Um, we want you to be productive and happy and be doing what you're interested in. And a lot of times, especially as the, you know, I mean, you guys have just finished one year of law school. I mean, how do you know? necessarily what you want to do. I mean, some of you, I'm sure, have been struck by lightning, and all you want to do is First Amendment law, right? And some of you have been struck by lightning, and all you want to do is tax. But 95% of you are not leaning this way, but I'm not absolutely sure. And you're not going to know until you actually go in and see what day-to-day -day life is work as it is. With what day-to-day -day life is like as a uh, you know, transactional associate working on private equity M&A, you may absolutely love it. Or you may say, that's not for me, and I want to do IP litigation, or you know, vice versa. But you, it's hard to know until you actually do it. And so I think it's important to be open. And, and one thing I would say is that you know, as you schedule your callback interviews, um, if you're worried or you have any concern um, about making sure that you talk to the right people in the firm, just call back on um, the, the recruiting office in the firm and say, you know, listen, you know, I, I, I said at the interview that it was purely corporate or it was purely litigation. Yeah, actually, I'm more open than that. So, you know, would you mind to take that into account in the, you know, as, you, as you're scheduling my interviews? I mean, it's, it only benefits you to, to, to be open. And if you're, you know, unsure about something and you're trying to hide that, um, it's not gonna, it's not gonna help you guys out. I would absolutely agree with that. Um, the only thing I would add is that, you know, while there are a lot of firms that do allow you to sample a lot of different things during the summer program, there are others that do put you in one practice area. Um, so what I would do before talking about your interests is I would try to sort of covertly find out what the structure of the summer program is. <coughs> you know, if you can ask, you know, what, you know, how, how are summer associates allocated working on you placed in a specific practice group? And then, you know, after you get that information, you can talk about, well, I'm really interested in this, but I'm also interested in this and this, um, and you can let the conversation move from there. Um, also, in advance, you can find this out, um, again, by talking to your classmates um, who are your head of group or you worked at the firm, maybe. Um, that's a great way to sort of get the inside information about whether you're going to really be in one area or Um, what would you consider inappropriate questions for an interviewee to ask? 
closing of the interview? Uh, we, we, there's a list, right? There's a list of like the third real subjects that you're not supposed to, to talk about. At least as an interviewer, you're not supposed to bring up, you know, marital status, you know, all kinds of things, right? I'm probably in trouble for even mentioning this. Yeah. You know, <laughs> But um, I, from, I mean, I don't know, a lot of people, I, I don't really think that there's anything necessarily that, that strikes me as something you should never talk about. I mean, if there's something that you know, you're interested in and you're passionate about, there's got to be some way that, that, that you can bring it up and, and ask the question. I will tell you, a lot of people get turned off by questions like, well, what's the quality of life like? Um, and, and, and I don't particularly care about that, but I think some people look at that, I mean, I don't react negatively to that question. But I think some people look at that as, hmm, this person doesn't want to work very hard. And, and so you've got to be careful about people taking that kind of a question in, in the wrong way. I don't particularly care about it because I think we have a great quality of life, right? I mean, so it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, I don't know. Is there anything that you think is off the other than the prohibited list of, you know, what are your yeah, no, marital I mean, plans and things like yeah, that? Yeah, you can't. You just don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of asking about the quality of life, of a great way to do that is to ask the people you're meeting with, what do you do when you want to work out? Right. That's a really good yeah. way, not only to get to know the people you're interviewing with, but if you ask that to the various interviewers and you get a lot of different answers and people have a lot of different stuff going on, you can pretty much deduce that you know the quality of life is good, there's a good work life balance. That's a good way to test that. Yeah. And, and the same with that. I've, I've had candidates ask me specifically how much I build and how much I build every year that I was at my firm. That's Again, like really much. not, I mean, not appropriate. Uh, it's, you know, what can I say? <laughs> and just like me said, you can get around that by saying, well, did you work, can you work on multiple cases? And how many, you know, different matters did you work at one time or the other? And were they all in discovery or at the expert uh, report level? You, you see what I'm saying? You, you can be clever about it. You can still get the answer you're looking for, but you just can't like straight out. I mean, my colleagues don't ask me how much I bill, and I wouldn't tell them probably. Um, so, so you got to be careful about any anything that um, I've actually had a candidate once that exactly asked me, "Well, I'm, I'm from uh, out of state. I'm looking forward to living in San Francisco. What kind of a life do you think I'm going to have in San Francisco?" Um, yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't know. And um, what, what? And he kept pushing. So that was the other side of it. Just know your audience and pay attention to your to your audience, right? I mean, if you're a little off, um, again, these lawyers that you'll be meeting with, everyone will be very nice, and they're trying to help, they're trying to get you in. Um, so the, they'll give you little hints that, you, you know what, that's kind of out there. Um, so, you know, listen to how they respond and move on. If you're not moving on and you keep asking, like this guy was asking me a second and third time, it's kind of like, okay, you're not getting the point, you're not getting the hint. And then again, it makes me think, what kind of a colleague are you going to be? Am I going to be able to assign you work? Because apparently you're not kind of getting where I'm going uh, very easily. So that's kind of what goes in our minds. It's not just, oh, that's not a question you should be asking, but it's more an issue of good judgment and how am I going to work with this person? And so, gauging how the interview is going. And right, it's like you're not picking up these hints that I'm giving you. <laughs> can, can, can we ask Nick like, what questions he asked last year? Going through the process, we're like, oh man, did I just say that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, I didn't have any of those. But um, I think the stuff that like is really apparent, like from their website and stuff that you can easily find, like how many offices do you have, or how many attorneys are in this office. I think I, I wouldn't waste my time with questions like that. One, you know, 20 minutes goes like pretty fast, and you want to ask stuff questions and get a good idea if they're a good fit for you. You know, they're a good fit for me. Um, and, and two, you know, it, it makes you sound like you didn't do your homework uh, and you, you didn't research the firm. And so simple stuff that you can find elsewhere, I would, I would definitely avoid that kind of stuff. So what kinds of questions did you ask? Um, let's see, it's been a little while. Um, I, would ask, I would ask questions like, you know, what, what's a typical work day? What do you, what do you stuff, type of things do you work on during the day? Um, What's um, what's some of your most favorite cases that you've worked on? What areas uh, are you most interested in? Um, if you, you know, along those lines. Yeah. And you don't need to keep all this stuff in your head either. You know, do not be shy about you know, the night before writing some of this stuff out and bringing it with you to the 
that piece. And we actually kind of like to see that because it shows that you've done your homework, you're prepared, you're interested, you know, you've got your stuff together and you don't want to leave anything. So. And just, uh, you know, ask questions that, just like Buzz would say, don't ask something that you think sounds good to the firm. Ask exactly uh, useful things for you. And, you know, I've had actually some of the better questions that I've gotten were, um, how are your cases staffed? How do you get staffed in a case? And have you seen your responsibilities or things that you did as a first year? Do you see some kind of progression? You know, things that I've done as a first year versus second versus third. Those were very good questions. Um, because, and again, why are they good for you? Because you get to see what your life will be like at a firm. I mean, if somebody tells you, well, I don't know, I was doing more interesting stuff as a first year than as a third year. That's a bit of a red flag. I mean, would you like that? Would you like to spend three years at a firm and feel like you're doing less interesting work than when you first came out of law school? Um, you know, again, some uh, candidates have asked me, I have a life science background, and they did notice that I was working a lot on very high-tech, you know, software-type cases. And they've asked, you know, it was kind of a similar thing. Like, I have an engineering background. Do you think I can do some pharma cases from time to time? And the reverse, right? Um, how did you, you know, Tell me about having a, a life science background and working on high tech, the high tech cases. What should I expect? Things like that. And again, um, those were the more interesting questions that showed me that this person actually uh, knew who I was and what I was doing and what the firm was doing. And at the end of the day, like I said, this is something useful for you to know. Like, would you want to be at that firm? Yeah, I think that's a, that, that was a perfect example of what I would call a strategic question, right? Because not only it shows that you've done your homework. Um, it shows that you know something about the person you're talking to. You learn something from the answer um, about you know what's the, the practice like, and then it probably allows you an opening to then respond kind of with a comment about yourself and your skills and your <coughs> abilities that's going to be useful to transmit information uh, to the person who's interviewing you. So that's like to the extent you can find you know those kinds of strategic questions to ask that you know, kind of hit each of those four points. I mean that's the perfect kind of question to ask. That's great. Okay, before I open it up to questions from our students, uh, I'll just ask one more universal general question, and that is just generally, what do you think tips the scale for, if all things being equal, as you described earlier, Buzz, what is it that tips the scale for a candidate? For someone for you to say, oh, we, we really would like to extend an offer to this person. Um, I'll start. <laughs> um, I, I think at the end of the 20 minutes or 30 minutes, if the candidate conveys to me that this is a person I can trust, that this is a person I would like to be staffed on a deal with or on a case with, and that, that is someone who is responsive, someone who is uh, able to handle the work and take responsibility basically over that piece of the work, but also not afraid to ask questions and not if the person doesn't know uh, certain things should not be afraid to call me or call someone else and figure it out as opposed to, you know, covering it up and <laughs> kind of waving hands and that kind of stuff. I think these are the absolutely most important things. And I know in the past we've recommended candidates just on these points alone, um, even if they had maybe not the brightest grades ever or not the best resume ever. It was this the, the candidate's ability to, to make us feel like, you know, they can handle the work. They're going to be a team player. I don't have to redo whatever it is they're doing. And actually, I, I wanted to make another point. Just keep in mind that everything you give to a firm, resume, a writing sample, grades, absolutely all that stuff is going to be fair game. Assume that the people will read the writing sample. Um, I didn't used to, but then somebody told me, well, the candidate wants, have you seen the typos in there? Um, and it was, it was the kind of a uh, typos that actually made a substantive difference. Um, so it's not just the comma or the, the whatever period was in the wrong place. It's, that, that it's just that that misplacement made a substantive difference. And so that kind of raised the flag. So don't be surprised if someone will ask you anything about any of that paperwork that you're giving to a firm. So this goes to preparation. This goes to, you know, again, tipping the scale. I absolutely agree with everything you just said. And you know, in terms of typos and things like that, you know, even if it's not substantive, you know, you look at your application materials and if there are problems, if things are spelled, if it's addressed to the wrong person in your cover letter, you know, if there are commas misplaced, even if it's not substantive, that's gonna show that you don't pay attention to details. Um, and details are very important when you're working as a lawyer. Um, you know, I, 
at my firm, we have a test. Um, at the end of interviews, it's our test is not only can you see yourself working with this person, but can you see yourself working with this person or hanging out with this person at the end of the day. You know, that's really important too. Um, you know, if you're going to be stuck in a hotel room in Korea doing document review with somebody for a month, you're going to want to get along with the person. <laughs> so um, that's really important. Yeah, I, I would I would echo all of that, and I'd say my, my own personal test is it's three in the morning, you've got to make a filing at nine o'clock in the morning, and you're in the copy room, and instead of collating your 500 page appendix to your to your brief, the copiers just started spitting pages all over the floor. Is this the type of person who's going to yell and scream at the guy who's running the, the copy machine, or is this a person who gets down on their hands and knees with the rest of the team and starts picking things? And the person who, who fits that the, the, the second part of that, that's, that's the person that I want to hire. And I want to hire, I agree with what Michelle said, regardless of what, you know, e even if it's a less stellar resume, less stellar transcript than, than some of the other people that are, that are coming through, that's, that's the person that I want to work with. That's great. Nicholas, is there anything you want to add in terms of your perspective about things that may have tipped the scale for you or things you did right or you appreciate that you did now that you've kind of gone through the whole process? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, just again to echo the things that have been said, um, I, I felt like the, the interviews that went best for me were the ones where I was the most calm and relaxed and it just felt like a really natural conversation. And a lot of the times the best ones were we were talking about things that had nothing to do with the law and nothing to do with anything on my, on my resume necessarily. I mean, I talked about, you know, so like to snowboard or fish or whatever, you know, stuff that gets them <coughs> talking about their interests. I feel like those were the best ones and we got the best connection. And again, they're really looking to see, do I want to work with this person? And several partners at my firm said, you know, will I, do I want to have lunch with this person? I think that's a, a good test. And if you're yourself and relaxed, um, I think that goes a long way. I actually have a question for you, if you don't mind, if that's okay. Yeah, we'd love to look at it. Um, because for the students, making your decision as to what firm you're going to go to is a whole other monster in this process. How did you make your decision? Um, so that is a tough, um, it was a tough decision. Unfortunately, it was a good problem to have, right? To have um, a, a few different firms to choose from. And it is tough to get a good idea of, even after four hours of being with, with the firm, I mean, you're with you know, multiple different people for a short amount of time, and so it is hard to gauge, you know, what it's like going to be like to work there. Um, but that, for me, that was one of the best ways is during the interview process. And, did I connect with these people more so than at other firms? And I think, you know, the people really make a big difference. Um, I met, you know, most firms I met with were great and everyone was really nice, but some I made better connections with than others. And for me, I wanted to work with people who I would like to go out to lunch with and who I would like to go you know, out with at night and stuff like that. And um, so that was a big part of, of making the decision was the, the people that I interviewed with. Um, and, and again, talking to people who had worked there before, who had summer before, um, and possibly trying to talk to people who have worked at the firm who are no longer there, right? Because then you're going to get a pretty candid um, view of what it's really like working there because, you know, my, in my view, we're both kind of putting on somewhat of a face, right? Um, and so if you can get that really candid um, idea or view of what the firm is like, um, that that is also really helpful. That's great, thank you. Does anyone have questions? Good. Um, other than the marathon aspect of callback interviews, what are really the major differences between what we're going through now with OCIs and the interview at the callback, if any? Especially anyone. since there's about the same amount of time before the interview is spent with each individual? Well, I would say this is probably um, the expectation uh, is that you've done some research, right? I think during OCI there is a bit of a lower threshold, um, and you, you absolutely have way less time. Uh, but by the time you actually show up to these firms, uh, the, the presumption is that you've had more time, uh, so you've had enough time to, to know more about the firm, number one, and two, the fact that you are a little more sure about why you're interviewing with that firm than you were during OCI, right? Because everyone knows OCI, it's like, whoever's going to give me an interview, I'm going to show up. Um, so 
by the time you do a call, I mean, you can turn down callbacks, right? I've turned down callbacks and said, you know what, no, I, that's fine. Um, so so I, I would say that this is sort of the, the presumption that is, I guess, either against you or for you, depending on how you look at it. I mean, by the time a firm, I absolutely agree with everything that Sean just said, it's by the time a firm invites you for a callback, you can be pretty certain that they're interested in you. Um, and it's, it's a lot of time for a firm to spend with you. Exactly. And it's a lot of attorney time, expensive attorney time to spend. Um, so the firm is interested in you. And I guess, um, like Michelle was saying, it's the, the presumption is that the students, if you do come and do a callback, is that you're interested in us as well. And we've done more research, and we've done more homework, and we want to see that you're interested in the students. And again, you know, it's, I think there's a higher threshold for that in the callback interviews. I would also offer that one of the differences really is more of an opportunity for you to market yourself. Because during the, the, the OCI on campus 20 minute interview process, you, it's one on one usually, maybe maybe you have two attorneys there, but you're marketing yourself to probably one person for 20 minutes. Whereas when you are invited to go into the firm for five hours and have 20 minute slots with multiple people, that's more people in the firm that you're basically selling yourself to. Um, you're also gathering information about whether you'd like to be there, so you have an opportunity to learn from multiple people, but also market yourself to multiple people and have more of a consensus on their side that you are someone that they'd like to hire. Yeah, definitely. At OCI, we're basically we're vetting your hiring, in terms of hiring criteria, in terms of your resume, in terms of your experience, it's much more focused on that. But when you get to the callback, it's a little bit more of a two-way street. And you know, do we want to work with you? Do you want to work with us too? So. One thing that I would add to that is um, typically you'll be going around to the individual attorney's offices. Um, at most callbacks that I had, I would, the interview was in their, in their office, each office. And so for me, one strategic type of thing to look for is look around their office briefly before, when you're walking in, see if there's some pictures on the wall, um, something that interests them, and you know, I'd try and, and bring that up. And, and uh, again, just going to the non-legal uh, aspect of the interview, I think that was a positive thing. If, if I saw some skiing pictures on the wall, boom, I have something to talk about with that person. Um, and so don't, you know, don't be kind of creepy about it. Um, <laughs> and look around their office. Um, right, but, you know, try and do it inconspicuously. And, um, you know, that was an advantage, I think, that you have going into their office. Yeah, definitely. It's, I've, in terms of going too far with that, I've had students <laughs> Google me and ask me some really personal and obscure questions based on things they found on the internet from when I was in high school. So again, you know, don't be creepy about it. <laughs> so that's actually really, those are both really good comments, and Nicholas's idea is really good, and I can just tell you that I actually have a picture, you never know about people, and I have something in my office that's specifically there to see if anyone will ask me about it. And I've had one person in all my years see the picture, it's the only picture, see it and comment on it. So, you know, you just never know. So I think that's a really good recommendation. How would you differentiate a law firm interview from an interview in corporate America or some other uh, law firm interviews don't seem to make any sense. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 in that respect, I mean that in most corporate jobs, like if you interview for a consulting, you know, job at McKinsey or whatever, you go interview at Google or you go interview at Facebook, they're actually going to test you on whether you actually do the job. I mean, it'll be like some situational, you know, type of, of interviewing that'll have to do with your skills and abilities and the demands of the job. Law firms don't do that at all. I mean. Just, it's, it's not, you know, it's bizarre to me, and, and, I, and I've been, you know, curious about this for, for, for ages, um, but they, it's just not the way it happens. Um, so that's the, that's the biggest difference, at least in, in my view. You don't need to bring your physics test, your physics textbook to a law firm interview. <laughs> I've worked, I've been out of college for seven years before I went to law school, so I know exactly what you mean, and I had different jobs, and completely, not in the legal field, I used to do health care finance, and completely different than uh, what I'm doing now, and I agree um, that those interviews were more like, oh, I see you did this project and that project, and how many people do you have on it, and how many people did you manage, and blah, 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 you know, very specific things. Um, I think in law firms, maybe there are some um, mean lawyers out there every so often that <coughs> try to question you on Prometheus or something crazy like that, <laughs> if you want to do patent, but I, I do know 
I never did that, or my colleagues never did, did that. I mean, if you wrote an article about X, Y, Z, you know, countable subject matter, maybe people will ask you. Again, it goes back to what I said, everything is fair game that you put on paper. Um, but yeah, generally, they will not ask you substantive stuff, tell me about, uh, you know, whatever section in the tax code, you know, nobody cares. Um, but because it's more of a personality fit. I think the, the difference is also in the legal profession that so much of your career, and that's why we're telling you these things, like do research the firm, so much about how you start out and how you're going to progress is about the people you work with. And it's, uh, and, and, and again, that's why these interviews are so fit oriented as opposed to, uh, you know, here is a problem. I did interview with McKinsey, and yeah, I had to do, you know, whatever problems and give them an answer. Um, Maybe some law firms are moving a little bit towards that. I think every so often some folks will ask you, tell me about a situation or you know, some of these uh, kind of behavioral questions. But generally speaking, you won't find that. I mean, if anything, I think it's easier having done it both ways. I, for, this to me was easier. But it's, I, I guess that varies for each person. Um. I actually just had the difficult situation question, but uh, on, on another note, uh, I was wondering, is it really important to schedule them like like within that week or the next week? Because, I, I mean, the schedules, obviously, everyone's got really busy schedules. And, I mean, should I be ditching my classes to schedule them? And, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, yeah, but, so I, or, or how, how available, I mean, do you just say I can just do it whenever, or if they ask you when you're available, do you say, here are the times I don't have classes? or? Um, you know, we certainly don't encourage students to miss class. Um, we understand that everybody is busy. Right. Um, you know, generally when I schedule callback interviews, um, you know, I start off and I say, you know, how does your how does your schedule work the next couple of weeks? Uh -huh. um, we get the conversation started there. You know, it has to work both ways. It, it's we're not going to make you come in at a time when you know you have a big paper due and you are missing two classes. We we really don't advocate. At the same time, it is important to get it as soon as you can. Okay. Uh, reasonably. Right. And part, and part of that's changed in the last couple of years with the different now guidelines yeah. on when you know offers can be extended and when they have to be accepted. And I don't know all the details, but what the the end result, the bottom line has been that interviews and OCIs have been very much front loaded into the process so that you know now, I mean, our last OCI is I think next week. It's really, you know, it's it's really compressed at the front end of the of the, of the schedule and the calendar, and the result is is that you know law firms are making offer decisions very early in the process. So you know, is whether you schedule it, you know, next week or two or three weeks out, the sooner is better for you because that gives you an earlier chance. And you know, if the law firm is going to make 50 offers or however many offers they're going to make, you know, later in the process, those are obviously a lot more of them are going to be used up. Right. earlier in the process. Right. So I think it's to your benefit to do it earlier uh, as, as, as opposed to later, you know, class schedules and other demands, you know, uh, aside. Right. Yeah. And just, it, just it's, it's almost like, um, um, what is it, like the settlement, right? Whoever runs first with the number, right? That's how the <laughs> decision is driven. If you're one of the earlier people, everyone else coming after you, all the other candidates, right? I mean, especially with smaller offices, you know, in some of these firms, um, you, everyone else will be judged against you, right? Because if you make a really, really good impression, then whoever interviews at the end of September or something will be like, well, I really like, you know, X guy, you know, that I saw the first or second week. It's just, it's just people's impressions. You, know, you have to remember that by the time they've interviewed, you know, 24 different people, it's a little harder to, <laughs> you know, still be that super shiny, Right. Personally, I, yeah, I, I schedule them as, as soon as possible um, because even if even if I did have to miss a class, I felt like it was worth it in the end. Right. Um, and I mean, there's a couple reasons for that. One, most firms do it on a, you know a rolling basis. They'll make they'll make their offer their initial you know however many offers, and then whoever accepts and say okay, well then we have a smaller group that we need to offer, so you have a better chance the earlier you go. And also, for me, you know, once you get that first offer. Um, a lot of pressure off so the earlier you get it done you know if you, if you, if you can get it you know not for right away that's you know, fantastic and then you can kind of relax a little bit more and 
even from a school perspective, so I was at Michigan and I only interviewed in San Francisco. I, I remember I missed like two full weeks at mm. different times. And it was easier for me to miss those weeks at the beginning of the semester, right? Because you can come back in the beginning and all the stuff is still a little you fuzzy anyway. You can, you know. Right. <laughs> it's, it's actually uh, more important if you miss school, I think, it, the, as the semester progresses. So. You talked earlier about how like you can't ask about like familial status and stuff like that. And I, I, I've heard people say different things about this, but like my, myself, I'm married, I have two kids, and some people have told me like, yeah, you want to mention that because it shows your stability or whatnot. And others have said, hey, don't mention that because then they're going to think you're going to be out of the office all the time with, with, with that. And what's kind of your guys' take on that? Uh, and, and is would, would you guys? have a problem with someone mentioning something like that in the interview? Absolutely not. The, rule, the way it works is there's this whole massive list of topics that we as interviewers can't bring up, but if the candidate brings it up, then we can talk about it. And, you know, if it's something that is a big part of who you are, I would absolutely bring it up if you're comfortable. And, you know, especially if you go into an interviewer's office and there's pictures of their kids all over the walls, I would definitely bring that up because not only is it going to tell the interviewer a little bit more about you, but it also could potentially a conversation with common ground. Yeah, I totally, totally agree, right? I, mean, I am the guy with the pictures of my kids, all <laughs> right? So it would be a, a good chance to, you know, to form a connection. Um, and, you know, and exactly like you said, you know, we wouldn't ask you, you know, what's your family situation. But if you bring it up, then, you know, it's something like I personally am delighted to, to talk about, oh, you know, your kids play baseball, they go skiing, you know, what, you know, what, you know, what are their interests? And it's a chance to, to learn something about you as an individual. But much, just dovetail with my question, much like the, the question that you um, had raised earlier about how sometimes your colleagues may misinterpret the question about quality of life, mm -hmm. do you feel that there are interviewers out there that um, somehow take the, the status as, um, you know, the, the, in the way that the question was asked, the, the, in the wrong way, that maybe you're going to have competing priorities or you're going to want to go off to soccer games every afternoon, or do, do, you, do you experience that coming up as the impression that people have? I've never, I've never sensed that reaction. I didn't either, and oh, some of the hardest working people that I knew at my old law firm had kids, and I, nobody blinked an eye. I mean, they were just, you know, they didn't <coughs> fall behind, they never missed a deadline. I mean, and so that's why that was never an issue. I mean, if people, if Ken just brought it up, it was okay, that's great, that's fine. You know? But yeah, I, I never had anyone say, oh my god, that's, that guy's always going to be gone. And the other thing is, most firms nowadays, hopefully, are very, very focused on diversity. You know, right. We want to hire a diverse group of candidates who come from a lot of different places and have a lot of different situations and can bring something unique to the table. Um, so I definitely wouldn't be shy. I, I'm pretty sure that you know, as long as you're polite, of course, it's going to be very popular. And I guarantee you, I absolutely 100% guarantee you that during your callback interview, at least one person is going to ask you, what do you do when you're not a member? Um, and that's a great opportunity. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much. I'll make one last point. And everything that we've talked about here, don't look at this as just callback. I would say if you take all these points that everyone has made and you try to implement them as a summer associate, as a starting attorney, these are things that will serve you very well. All these things about being prepared and you know, knowing your audience and getting the hints and all this other stuff. These are things that will, I think, serve you very well in practice. And, uh, you know, again, you got to uh, take them with a grain of salt. But don't think of this as just callback. I mean, this is, this is something that we use, I think, every day. And, um, uh, and I, I believe they'll serve you well. One thing that I'd like to just add, I think that was helpful for me, is um, a lot. Of, initially, when I started out, I was kind of letting the interviewer run the interview and kind of, you know, kind of waiting for questions and just kind of letting them kind of dictate the entire pace. And I think to a certain extent, you want to let them do that. But um, I kind of caught on that it's, you know, there there was two or three things that from my past and my resume that I wanted to talk about that I think were significant things in my life that I thought would apply 
really well into the legal profession, something that they would like to see. And so I always tried to work that in somehow into the interview of my past work experience or whatever it may be. And so I think um, don't be shy about, you know, kind of turning the interview in your favor and talking about stuff that you want to talk about, that you want them to hear, because you have, you know, 20 minutes to get to get what you want them to hear and that they necessarily can't get from your resume. And so um, there was two or three things that I always tried to push um, to get into my interview to talk about. That's great. Well, you guys have all got a leg up. I mean, on, I mean how many people were in the, the 2L class? Which one? Oh, I don't know. A couple hundred? Yeah, definitely. <coughs> Plus the 300. All right, so, but you guys are the ones you're like, you know, doing your research, so you got a leg up, so, you know, relax, be confident, and, you know, good luck to everybody. Be yourself. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, thank you so much, all of you, for joining mm -hmm. us.